So let me start uh, as a young person who lived in a black neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhoods were segregated as far as where you lived and whether or not there were whites that lived in black neighborhoods or blacks that lived in white neighborhoods. But uh, the first years, kindergarten, first and second grade, well, all the way through uh, schooling, I lived in what was a black neighborhood. But when I was in the third grade, we moved into a neighborhood where whites were, had moved out and blacks were moving in. But there was a, a family that was lived across the alleyway from us that could not afford to move out, and it was a white family. And I was nine, eight years old, going on nine. And they had a son that was eight years old, going on nine, this white family. He didn't have anyone to play with, nor did I. So for some reason, we met one day, and the rest was history. He was my playmate, and I was his. So we played cowboys and Indians and all the things that, that we used to play back in the day. We didn't have uh, the conveniences of uh, removing ourselves from our friends with our phones, you know, even uh, so we didn't have that. So we had playmates. I don't think that he had ever been downtown to the, to the movie theaters. Uh, we did not have malls at that time, shopping malls. Everything that you wanted to do was downtown. Uh, clothing, uh, whatever it was, you had to go downtown to do it. His sister uh, came back to the house and took him to the downtown theater. And I think that was the first time he had been to the downtown theater because when uh, he came back, he ran over to my house and he was excited. He was telling me about the glitter of the lights outside, the smell inside, you know, popcorn and hot dogs and smelling good and the plush seats. And of course, he told me about the movie that he went to see. And he said, ask your mother to take you. I want you to see this. He got me all excited. So I asked her. And so uh, she said, my mother made it quite clear that what we were going to do, which was to go downtown and see a movie, that's it. We're not going shopping, we're not going to get any ice cream, we're not doing any of that. I'm taking you to this movie. And so uh, we started, got off the bus downtown, and we had to cross the street to get to the movie theater. Now, uh, I'm going to be moving around a little bit. Let's say, for example, that this is a street, and I'm on this side of the street, and the theater's over here, and you are the ticket agent. Young lady, you're the ticket agent. And where that space is, there's an alleyway that goes down beside the theater. So as we're crossing the street, I'm doing this. This is during a time of segregation. And my mother has me by this, and she's doing this. And finally she says, we can't go in that way. Because she knew which way I, I wanted to go in, to you. And so I looked up and I said, but my friend said, and I stopped right there. The reason I stopped was because she would have taken this off of me. <laughs> And uh, I would have been in time out. <laughs> so we eventually had to go down this alley where it was dark. She purchased the two tickets. We had to go all the way up into the balcony because colored people were not allowed to sit on the main floor. We had to sit in the balcony. I never really forgot that or maybe it was something that was, it hit me here that I couldn't go into that, where my friend wanted me to go. And so, um, apparently I didn't forget it. I always use the example of, how many of you know what a green thumb is? How many of you plant flowers? We call that green thumb. Whereas you put a, take a bud, a little bud, and plant it at a certain time of the year, 
and then the following year, something comes up. I had planted a bud in my soul. Now I forgot about it over the years, but then when I was in uh, my sophomore year in college in 1959, I heard about what was called a workshop. That we're gonna make a difference. We're, we're gonna have a workshop, a nonviolent workshop. And so that's when that bud that was planted at nine years old started flourishing. It just started flourishing because I took part in the nonviolent workshops. Now, Nashville, to me, was a God sent movement simply because of the people who were our leaders, young leaders, and there was a couple that were a little older than we were. Um, had not planned to come to Nashville. Jim Lawson was a student at Oberlin College in Ohio. Shortly after the bus boycott ha that happened in Montgomery, where Dr. King was said to be the leader of the bus boycott in Montgomery, he was well known and a lot of universities was requesting him to come and speak. Dr. King had studied uh, the methods of Gandhi when he was a student at uh, Morehouse in Atlanta. But Jim Lawson was a student at Oberlin who had studied in India for three years. He had studied, he was a missionary in India and he studied the methods of Gandhi, the nonviolent methods of Gandhi. And he was a student at Oberlin. So Dr. King was invited to speak at Oberlin and they had a reception for him after he spoke, but it was just for the faculty. But a friend of Lawson was in charge of the, of the uh, reception, and Lawson said, you've got to get me into this reception. I need to meet this man and talk to him. He was successful in getting into the uh, reception. He talked to Dr. King, and Dr. King simply said, will you forego your education here and come south? He didn't say where. He just said, will you forego your education and come south? And Lawson did that, but he transferred, Lawson transferred to Vanderbilt University, which is in my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. And so he brought with him the methods of nonviolence that he had studied and what he had learned in India. The Reverend Kelly Miller Smith decided that, well, we're going to make a change here in Nashville. And in this group, NCLC, the National Christian Leadership Conference, we're going to have somebody to represent the makeup of Nashville. It wasn't just a black uh, group of people that belonged to NCLC. It were black, white, Jewish, whatever was there in Nashville, whatever Nashville rep was represented by. They were a part of NCLC. So early 1958, or late 1958, the ministers went downtown to the five, what we called five and dime stores. They were clothing stores or to the drug store because all these places had uh, lunch counters. And what they would do, they would go downtown, they would sit at the lunch counters until they were told that they could not serve them, that they would have to leave. And what they were doing was counting the number of stools in these lunch, uh, in these stores. Even the drug stores had lunch counters. So they would count the number of stools. And as they would leave, they would look for the telephones, the pay phones that were on the walls outside, you might find a phone booth. They were getting the locations of those booths. So in 1959, the fall of 59, is when they started the workshops, the nonviolent workshops. As I tell students, we did not have cell phones. We couldn't call each other and say, hey, there's gonna be a workshop tomorrow night at such and such a place. It was by word of mouth or by the rotary phone. Now, I'm sure we all know what a rotary phone is. And so the word was going around on the different campuses, the black campuses, also 
at the Vanderbilt campus, uh, right across the street from Vanderbilt is Scarrett and Peabody. Uh, there were very few African Americans that went to those schools because those schools were still segregated. But the Divinity School at Vanderbilt was integrated. And Lawson was a student at, uh, at uh, Vanderbilt. So we started me having meetings and he would talk to us about Gandhi, about uh, nonviolent, how to remove yourself from a situation mentally, how to protect yourself physically, and, he t and we learned a lot of songs. Uh, our, our group was known, known as a singing movement because music is very important in the movement. Because when something happens to you, there's always a song for it. And we're going to do some singing here before I sit down. <laughs> so we started in 1959. In 1960 was one of the first sit-ins, not in Nashville, but in Greens Greensburg, uh, South Carolina. I think I got the right state. There were four students, North Carolina, thank you. There were four students, uh, young men, who had been thinking about this sit-in at Woolworth. Woolworth, uh, in, back in the day, was like uh, Walmart is today. Woolworth was na not only nationwide, I think they were worldwide. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, they were like the, yeah. And so that was one of the first stores that we decided that we would go to. But uh, these four students, they had their first sit in February 1st, 1960. 13 days later, we had our first sit in in Nashville. We had 100 volunteers. We did not tell the press or TV or radio that we were going to have a sit-in. And we went to three of the stores downtown. They were on the same street. And people are looking like, what are they doing? What are these people doing? They know they can't, not supposed to be sitting in at like this. And we did not tell our parents that we were going to have a sit-in. And so once the press got a hold to that, even the black community wanted to know, what are these kids doing now? They know that we can't sit at these lunch counters. They know we can't go in the front door. We know, they know we can't go into swimming pools and hotels and what have you, because all of Nashville was segregated. The editor of the paper at that time said that Nashville was worse than apartheid in South Africa. So we had 100 volunteers the first time we went downtown. The second week, we had 200 volunteers. By, from between the 13th and the 27th, on the 27th, we had over 400 volunteers, students. And we also had, during that time, we continued to have our workshops, learning how to take a punch, not fight back to remove yourself from a situation. And th there were some people that said, well, I can't go downtown and let somebody hit me and not hit them back. They played a role in the desegregation of Nashville as well because they had cars. All right, if you can't take the punishment, would you be willing to go to the campus pick up a load of students, bring them down to the church, which was only a couple of blocks from where we would be demonstrating, and take them back when the demonstration is over. So we had people who could do that, who had cars that would pick up students, bring them to the church, and when the demonstrations were over, take them back to their school. More like what we used to call a jitney, taking them back and forth, because they were not able to take the punishment. I was in on the very first sit-in on the 13th. Now, I was a student at Tennessee A&I, Agriculture and Industrial College, a music uh, major, music education major. So there were times when I couldn't go to meetings because I had a band rehearsal at six o'clock every evening and I had to be there. So I did have, was part of the very first sit-in. About the second sit-in, a third, 
I was what you call an observer and a runner. And what that meant was I would be downtown, but I wouldn't be in a store sitting down. I would be outside because the stores had the big bay windows where you could look inside or if you were inside, you could see what was going on outside where they had the, the people just uh, dressed up in the windows and what have you. So I'm standing there as if I don't know what's going on. And the reason for that is if something happens with the students like being arrested, then I would go to the nearest phone and call the church. And what was so unique about our group was, and we got just the right number here, I was counting earlier, a group of four, four, one, two, three, four, four, and four, okay? Let's say, for example, you went to Walgreens, the four of you, but you're not all white, okay? You're playing a different role here. Uh, and you were arrested, and I'm, I'm the lookout person, and I see the paddy wagon coming because I know they're gonna arrest somebody. And so I would go look for the nearest phone, and I would call uh, the church, and I would say, the four students at Walgreen are being arrested. That meant that the next four would leave the church. And by the time these four are in the paddy wagon, you would be walking right back into the same store that they just came out of and took their seats. And then I'd call again, the second four have been arrested. Another four would come and take those seats until they just decide to close the door and lock the door. And that happened on the 27th of February when we had a mass arrest, over 100 students were arrested on a Saturday. They did not bail out because if you bail out of jail on the day that you are arrested, you don't know when your trial is gonna come up. And so when they went before the judge, it was a 30-day fine, $50, uh, $50 fine or 30 days in jail. This is in February, school is going on. So when they walked up to the judge, uh, they said, jail or bail? We'll take jail because we didn't do anything wrong. We can go into those stores and shop and buy clothes or whatever. We can buy merchandise, but we just can't eat at the counter. So we filled the jails. Nashville was the first uh, movement, to my knowledge, that said jail no bail. We're gonna fill these jails up. And so they did, and so mon that Monday uh, is when they uh, went before the judge or what have you. Now. There was a doctor who had a son and a daughter in jail. He was one of the top doctors at Meharry. He called on Harry Belafonte and Sidney Portier to come to Nashville. And in one night, they raised $40,000 in 1960. Just think what that's equivalent to today. $40,000, we're talking nickel and dime, people who are nickel and dime. They raised that money, and so we were never really charged. Uh, there's nothing on record, I might say, of the sit-ins. We continue to have the sit-ins, not only with the four, three or four stores, but we went to theaters where we had walk-ins. We couldn't walk in, but we could walk up to the window and be refused and then you move on. So if one of the white students, because in Nashville, our group was equally white and black. It wasn't all black, it was white and black. And so if a white male was, was to walk up to the window and I was behind him, I was the next one to walk up to the window, the person that's selling the ticket would refuse to sell him the ticket. The reason being is because they figure, well, if I sell him a ticket, he's gonna give it to me. And that gives me the opportunity to go in the front door. And once you go in the front door, it's integrated. So they didn't sell anybody tickets. So music, again, was very important to us. During one of the stand-ins at the movie theater, there was a young lady, uh, 
a young white man walked up to her smoking a cigarette and he was puffing and puffing and getting that cigarette just as red as he could. And he told this black girl, he says, I'm gonna put this cigarette out in your face. So her friend was behind her and said, I'll put my hand up to your face and he can burn my hand and not your face. And so she said, no, he's not gonna burn me. So within her soul, she started singing, ain't gonna let no cigarette turn me around. Turn me around, turn me around, ain't gonna let no cigarette. Turn me around, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. The young man dropped a cigarette and walked away, but he didn't hear her. On the last night, it took us 13 times to go to the theaters, to integrate the theaters. And on that last night, Jim Lawson was at the end of the line. We were on our way back to the church. A young white man walked up to him, behind him, and just turned him around real fast and spat in his face, spat in Jim's face. And the first thing Jim said, do you have a handkerchief? And before the young man knew it, he went in his back pocket and gave him the handkerchief. <laughs> he had on a motorcycle jacket with different little emblems on the jacket and so Jim recognized uh, the jacket and he started talking about these emblems that were on the jacket. And the next thing you know, this young man, they were in deep conversation about motorcycles. And it was just a way to uh, put uh, water on the fire to ease the tension. There was another time that uh, we were demonstrating when we were carrying signs this time. We were not talking, just carrying signs. And there was a young divinity student who was not a part of our group, a white divinity student who was not a part of our group. But I guess he was sympathetic to the cause and he asked, may I carry a sign? By all means, you can carry a sign. And then that was one of those white haters that saw this young man come in to pick up a sign and start carrying it. And he, the hater walked behind him and hit him in the back of the head, but it didn't knock him down. And the police saw that. This was one time that the police arrested the hater. Now I wanna just kind of fast forward to 1961. You saw John Lewis speaking. John Lewis is now a congressman in, in uh, the US. John Lewis took part in the first Freedom Ride. And that Freedom Ride was sponsored by CORE, C-O-R-E, Congress of Racial Equality. The chairperson was uh, James Farmer. And the reason that Farmer wanted to have the Freedom Ride was because very few people knew about CORE. They knew about the NAACP, they knew about SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They knew about those two organizations. So he wanted CORE to come up to the same level as those two organizations so that people would give money to the cause, the cause of being free, the cause to eliminate segregation in wherever they uh, wanted to go. And they would have the funds to do that. And so he decided on the Freedom Rides because the uh, Supreme Court in 1945, I believe, said that uh, I could sit anywhere on a bus, that there was an empty seat, because at one time the buses were segregated. This has nothing to do with Rosa Parks because that <coughs> Montgomery was local buses. Uh, the Trailway and the Greyhound were uh, national, they went across state lines. And so the Supreme Court had said that uh, I could sit anywhere I wanted to because of a lady by the name of Irene Morgan who in 1943 was on a Greyhound bus going from Virginia, I think, up until Baltimore. And uh, they got on, the police got on the bus and told her she had to move to the back of the bus. She refused, took her case to the, all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that if you are, if there's an empty seat up front, then uh, you can sit anywhere, that or a black person can sit anywhere that there's an empty seat on the bus. But the thing that they left out was when the bus gets to a terminal and you get off the bus, 
and you want to go inside and have a coffee or something or go to the bathroom to get back on the bus to go to another city, that you could go through the front door. But in the South, they had not removed those signs that said white only and colored only. White water, colored water, white restroom, colored restroom. They had not removed those signs. And so what CORE was doing was testing those facilities. And in the South, they said that uh, they didn't even want you sitting in a seat in the front. They didn't want me sitting in a seat in the front. And so since you're the closest one to me, I'm moving slow for the camera. <laughs> We are on a Greyhound bus, integrated. But the South says, mm mm, you can't do that. And so when the bus would stop at a terminal, we would get off the bus. So we're going to get off the bus. I think you know what to do. Okay? Now, this is the colored section at the station over here. This is where I. I'm supposed to go because it says color. This is the white section, okay? So the bus pulls into the terminal. We get off the bus and guess what? <laughs> That's what happens. That's what CORE did. Because the signs were supposed to come down because the, uh, the Supreme Court said that those signs shouldn't be up. But the people in the South who owned the stations had not taken the signs down. While CORE, they left uh, Washington, D.C. on the 4th of May, 1961. And in them leaving uh, Washington, D.C., several people were arrested as they were traveling down South. Uh, John Lewis was beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina by a policeman, by a white policeman. He went inside to get something to eat and was beaten by a white policeman. But the FBI had pictures and they had witnesses of what happened to John Lewis. Now John Lewis was trained by the man that trained me, Jim Lawson. John Lewis was in school. The FBI went up to John and said, we have photos, we have witnesses of this man beating you, this police officer beating you, all you have to do is sign a complaint. John Lewis said, I will not sign a complaint because he's my brother and I love him. Because that's what we were taught, was to love your neighbor as yourself. But John was a student at that time. Once John became a congressman in Washington, D.C., some years later, this same man, who was a lot older, uh, and his son went to Washington, D.C., to John's office to apologize to John Lewis for what he did to him in 1961. To my knowledge, that's the only person that I know of that has had someone to apologize to them for what, the, what happened to them. So, John also had to get off the bus. You saw uh, the burning bus. That was in Anderson, Alabama. After Corps had reached uh, Atlanta, they had uh, dinner with Dr. King. They were trying to get Dr. King to go on the Freedom Rides. And Dr. King said, I will not go on the Freedom Ride. And my sources tell me that it's going to get worse after you leave Atlanta. Well, John Lewis had to get off the Freedom Ride because he had signed up to go overseas with the Quakers. And they said, well, you're either going to be a Freedom Rider or you're going overseas. And you need to come back to Nashville and make a decision. And so he got off the Freedom Ride before, I guess, when they left Atlanta. And so, but that night, that was a Mother's Day. May 17th was the day that the bus was burned in Anderson. The Klan... Uh, blocked the front door. They had regular passengers. They only had six <laughs> Freedom Riders on the bus, but the Klan didn't know who the Freedom Riders were. The bus was full of passengers. 
the word had come all the way down from Washington, D.C. about this Freedom Ride thing. See, they didn't put it in the paper that we're going to have a Freedom Ride and we're doing this and we're doing that and we're doing the other. But there were people in the, maybe in the Justice Department, people in the FBI who were Klansmen. They knew the number, of the, what the bus number was, and all you had to do was follow that bus. You knew that there were Freedom Riders on that bus. So they had made a plan to attack the Greyhound bus in Anderson, Alabama on that Sunday, because they knew that that bus would be coming through Anderson on the Sunday. And the man that uh, made the announcement had a grocery store about eight miles outside the city limits. And he said, on Sunday, there's going to be a Greyhound bus right here at my store. It's going to have those uh, niggers and nigger lovers on there. And this is where we're going to attack the bus. Well, once the bus pulled into the terminal, and the terminal is nothing but a, a, an alleyway with building on each side. It can only get one bus in this alley. And so they blocked the door. To, and while they were blocking the door, the Klansmen were, had a couple lying on the ground in front of the bus so the bus couldn't come out of the alley. And they had uh, knives and, and uh, ice picks putting holes in the tires. And they finally let the bus out and they had a car in front of the bus so that the bus couldn't get up to 50, 60 miles an hour because they wanted that bus to stop right in front of that store. And that's what it did. The tires were flat. The driver got off the bus, inspected the tires, and walked away. Didn't say anything to the passengers. He may have had something to do with it himself. And so finally someone took a crowbar, knocked the rear right window out, threw a Molotov cocktail in there, and the bus caught on fire in the back. There was a mild explosion. People couldn't get off because the Klan is blocking the door. And so there was a mild explosion and everybody said, it's going to blow. So they ran and this gave the people a chance to get off the bus before it actually burned everybody. But it was so much black smoke that uh, they were coughing and choking and what have you when they got off the bus. But it just so happened, praise God, there was a young lady the store owner had a daughter who was 12 years old. When she saw people getting off the bus, she went and got a bucket of water, some glasses, and towels. Came across the road, these people lying on the ground, coughing and trying to get the sweat and stuff off their face. She stopped at every person. She would stay with one, give them some water, wipe their face. When they were okay, she'd go to the next one. And she did that. And so the Klan is looking at her like, mm, wait a minute, what's going on here? Because her parents were members of the Klan. And so they had a meeting to find out what they were going to do with this girl. At first they were going to kill her. And then they just, even the parents agreed with it. And they decided that to say that she was a little bit off in the head. And so the, her classmates, she was only 12, she stayed there until she finished high school, but she was, she was like uh, my good friend there in the back. She was ostracized the whole time, the rest of the time she was in school for what she did. And so when she graduated, she moved to California. Uh, now, the, the Trailway bus, when it left Atlanta, it has the same routing as the Greyhound, but it left an hour later and it bypassed Anderson, Alabama, and the next stop was Birmingham. And so Bull Connor, who was head of the police department in Birmingham, told the head of the Klan, said there will be a bus here, there will be a trailway bus here at a certain time, and you can do anything that you want to to the passengers. My policeman will give you 15 minutes to do whatever you want to do. We will not stop you, but you only have 15 minutes. And it just so happened that there was a reporter at the Trailway bus terminal that that's how you have that one picture of these people beating up passengers. If you were on that bus, had nothing to do with the Freedom Rides, you would have been beaten because they didn't know who the Freedom Riders were. Mm -hmm. They were beaten so badly that some of them were hospitalized and farmers decided, well, we've gone as far as we can go. The plan was to go all the way to New Orleans, to be in New Orleans by 
May 17th, to celebrate. They were going from Washington, D.C., down through the South, Atlanta, uh, Anderson, Alabama, Birmingham, Montgomery, Jackson, Mississippi, and then down to uh, New Orleans by the 17th to celebrate. And I know most of you know, uh, may know what, the, what day that is and why they were going to celebrate and think about it. Well, we in Nashville, on that same day, the 17th, the Mother's Day, had just integrated our movie theaters downtown. So that was a bittersweet day for us. So that night, we met at the church. We called Farmer, Jim Farmer, Mr. Farmer. We would like to have your permission to restart the Freedom Ride. His remark, well, you're gonna get somebody killed. You see what happened to my group. Mr. Farmer, we would like to have your permission to restart the Freedom Ride. I don't think you should do it. You're going to get somebody killed. Mr. Farmer, we are asking you. We would like to restart the Freedom Ride. So finally he gave in to say, okay, you can do it, but somebody's going to get killed. Diane simply said, we know somebody's going to die, but we're not going to let violence overrule nonviolence. As soon as we get our people together, we're going to restart the Freedom Ride. Well, the, the, uh, that was the student group, but the adult group, NCLC, they were the ones that had the money. And so once we started volunteering, we were at the church. Oh, I don't know how many of us were at the church. But I ended up in the third group. Uh, John Lewis was the spokesperson of the first group. Bernard Lafayette was a spokesman for the second group. James Bevel was a spokesperson for the third group, and I was in the third group to leave Nashville. But we had to have money to buy tickets. And I think in our first group there were 13 uh, Freedom Riders. They wrote us a check, but there was one signature missing because they didn't want us to go. There was one signature missing. <coughs> And so finally, we went to uh, the richest number man. See, when I was coming up, you, people would come to your house and say, what number do you want to play? You play three numbers. It's just called lotto now. It's legal now. But it was illegal when I was coming up. Uh, so uh, they, if they knew that you played the numbers, then they'd come to your house and uh, what, what number you want to play? You write it down and you might put down two pennies and uh, two pennies was the equivalent, uh, one penny, it was 600 to one. That's what the odds were when you played, when I was coming up. So uh, we found, we looked at the check and said, it's a good check, but it doesn't have that last signature that we need. So we went, we went to the richest number man, black number man in, in Nashville, went to his house, told him what our situation was. He cashed the check. And it just so happened that he was a member of the church that the check was written on. And he said, I'll get, I'll get the check cashed when I go to church Sunday. And so our first group was able to leave. Now, it was 13 in that first group, but only 12 got on the bus in Nashville. There was a white female who was to be just the, the observer. She missed the bus in Nashville, so there was a black student that drove her from Nashville to Pulaski, Tennessee. Pulaski, Tennessee is where the head of the Klan was. Took her to the Greyhound bus. They got there before the actual Greyhound bus did. And she bought the ticket and, and got on the bus. We often talk about that, like what would have happened to the young man that drove her down there if the Klan had actually seen seen that, this white woman in, in, with the black man in this car. Well, she got on the bus, and she was to be the observer, as if she didn't have anything to do with what was going on. So when, uh, and Jim Swerg, come over here, Jim Swerg. <laughs> Jim Swerg and uh, a young man from Tennessee State were, uh, Tennessee and I, were in the front seat across from the driver. So when the bus, when our students made it to the uh, city limits of Birmingham, 
They stopped the bus, the policeman got on the bus and requested that we move to the back of the bus. We refused to move. So they took us off and took us to jail. You, no, you can go to jail, I gotta stand here and talk. Because <laughs> there's a story about you. So then they let the bus come on into the terminal, but once the bus got into the Greyhound bus terminal, they did not let anyone off the bus, not even the passengers. Now in Nashville, we had already desegregated our Greyhound and, and, and trailway buses. So if you were coming from the north or northeast into Nashville, it was integrated. And when you got on in Nashville, the bus was integrated. But once it started down south, when it got to Birmingham, no, no, no. The bus is not integrated. You can't sit there. So they take Jim Swerg off to jail. They take me off to jail. And uh, he's in one part of the jail and the other part of the jail. Now, because he's white, the white community or the jailers are really mad at him because now not only is he a freedom rider, he is also what they called a nigger lover because he's helping the black people. They put him in a drunk tank. Now this is only a few days after they had uh, beaten the original Freedom Riders. Uh, this is one of those Freedom Riders, one of those nigger lovers, and uh, you can do anything that you want to him. We're not going to come back here and st stop you. So the jailer walks off, he closed the door and walk off, and Jim is in there with all the drunks. And so finally the jailer said, let me go back here and see what's going on. Anyone, tell me what you think is happening with Jim. Yes. Singing. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else? What do you think? Oh, say it again. Beating. Beating. Singing. Beating. How about you, young man? Okay, beating. Uh, and you? Mm -hmm. I'm going with the singing. You're going with the singing? Yeah. Okay. Well, the singing was, uh, you're right. Uh, <laughs> Jim had taught them what, what you can consider is a national uh, anthem when it comes to freedom rides or sit ins or whatever. And so when the jailer went back and opened the door, these drunks are singing, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. shall overcome someday. Now, the lady that got on the bus who was the observer was a student at Scarrett Bennett in Nashville. She was from New York. And so uh, as they were taking the students' names down, Apparently, Bull Connor recognized the last name of this lady, the student, took her to his office. I don't know if he had a talk with her, but he called her father in New York, and her father flew down to get her out of jail. And um, took her into Bull Connor's office, and it comes to find out that he and her father and Bull Connor went to college together. They knew each other. And so the daughter says, I don't want to go home. I finally, I finally found something that I can do to make a difference. And that is being a part of the student movement. He took her, bailed her out of jail, took her back to New York, and for years she and her father did not get along. Apparently, he allowed her to come back to Nashville to Scarrett Bennett to finish her education. And she became one of the uh, top student leaders in the movement after she finished college. 
Uh, she lived just outside of Nashville, and then she was working a lot with Dr. King. She was on uh, some of his committees. Now, that first group was taken out of jail by Bull Connor. He said, I'm going to take you back to Nashville, Tennessee. Let's say, for example, this is Birmingham. Uh, the young lady here is the state line of Alabama and Tennessee, which is Ardmore. And then let's say that the cameraman is in Nashville. He takes the students out late at night, out of jail, and takes them to Ardmore. And he promised to take them to Nashville, but he lets them out at the state line, Alabama, Tennessee state line, that, that particular city is divided by Tennessee and uh, Alabama. He said, there's a railroad track over there. Uh, you'll find your way back to Nashville. And the, uh, there was a black African-American lady sitting in the limousine next to Bull Connor. And she said, you know something I like, uh, she called him Bull. Yeah, she called him Bull. And so she said, Bull, you know, I like Western movies. He said, uh, I like Western movies too. She said, one of my favorite movies was uh, uh, sh uh, showdown at the OK Corral. He said, oh, that's one of my favorites. She said, now, you know in that movie that they would always have the shootout at high noon. And he said, yes. And she looked at him and she said, we'll be back in Birmingham by high noon. Now, how did she know that? She just, that's what she told him. We'll be back in Birmingham by high noon. So that group found a phone and uh, called our office, because our office was open 24-7, called our office. Once we found out that they were taken out of jail, our second group left Nashville by train and car. They did not go. They were going to Birmingham to take the place of those who had been taken out of Birmingham. They called our office. A young man borrowed a station wagon from a white uh, lady who worked at one of the colleges and her daughters were a part of the sit-ins. And her daughter was in the second group, one daughter was in the second group to leave Nashville, either by car or train, going to Birmingham. Because we wanted to, that's the way we did in the sit-ins. When one person was arrested, somebody else would take their place. And so they were on their way to Birmingham and our first group is in Ardmore. They pick them up, and now they bring them back to Birmingham. We got two groups in Birmingham. The Attorney General, Bobby Kennedy, sent a young man by the name of John Siegenthaler, who at one time was the editor of our newspaper in Nashville, The Tennessean. Uh, Bobby Kennedy had hired John Siegenthaler to be a part of the Justice Department. John Siegenthaler was a uh, new the Freedom Riders, the Nashville Freedom Riders, because he was writing about them when we were having the sit-ins. And so uh, he's in Birmingham. He gets the, uh, starts talking. He, he made a phone call to Nashville and said, talk to Diane Nash. You need to stop those Freedom Riders. I'm, I'm kind of ahead of myself here. They're already gone, sir. We know somebody's going to die, but we're not going to let violence overrule nonviolence. I don't know if I had mentioned it earlier, but we signed our last wills and testaments because we knew somebody was going to die. And we were willing to give up our lives so that people could ride anywhere on a bus, go inside and eat and feel good about it and feel comfortable. Now, the first and second group are in Birmingham. They finally get a driver to take them to uh, Montgomery, Alabama. That was the next stop. And this is where the group from Tennessee, from Nashville, met with a lot of violence. You saw Jim Swerg. Jim Swerg was beaten outside of the bus terminal in uh, Montgomery. That's the one that was lying in bed and said, we're going to keep coming. Uh, he was a student, exchange student at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. John Lewis was beaten outside the bus terminal. We had a uh, African-American student that was beaten so badly that uh, they, they knocked him down. Two men knocked him down. One put their foot on his head. Another had a steel rod trying to put it through his ear. Uh, one of the 
two of the white females were trying to get away from the Klan and John Siegenthaler pulled up in a car and wanted to get them into his car to, for safety. And the one that, uh, one young uh, female got in his car and sat down. The second one, Sue Wilbur, she was being beaten up by two guys. I don't know how big they were, but they were pounding on her. And John Siegenthaler describes it as these look like two big football players just pounding on her head, knocking her down, picking her up and knocking her down. And then uh, he pulls up in his car and one girl gets in and he's trying to get Sue Wilbur into his car. This is the one that's being beaten. And he gets her to the door of the car and then she puts her hand up to the door jams and said, Mister, you're gonna get hurt. I've been trained in nonviolence and I'm willing to take the beating. And so by this time, one of the men that were beating her asked John Seekin, said, he said, who are you? And John turned around, he said, I'm with the Justice Department. And by the time he got that out, the guy hit him with a lead pipe here, knocked him out and then kicked him on, under the car. And I guess they walked away from Sue. Um, some of the students were able to run away to safety. Uh, some of the people hid them in their homes. And that was on a Saturday, uh, that was uh, May 20th, 1961. I'm still in Nashville. May 23rd, I get in a car. There are five of us in a car. We rented a car to go and relieve those who had been hospitalized or those who needed to come back to Nashville. Our story was that if we were stopped by the police at any time, we were a singing quintet going down south to sing at a church. And there were at least three of us that could sing that was in that car. We were going to Montgomery to relieve those who had been beaten. Now, I knew about the burn of the bus before I left Nashville. I knew about the beatings in Birmingham, and I knew about the beatings of our students. That, in a way, uh, is enough to say, mm -mm, I'm not going, because our next stop was Jackson, Mississippi, the worst city and the worst state of all. That was our next stop. I could have said no. So I drove down, I drove down with this group to relieve some people in Montgomery on the 23rd, on the 24th, I was on a bus, Greyhound bus, on my way from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi. I arrived in Jackson, Mississippi. John Lewis was my seatmate. We only had freedom riders. They didn't have regular passengers on the bus. And we had the National Guard on the bus with fixed bayonets, as if we were gonna do something to them. Uh, we get off the bus, and there's a, the news uh, TV person is watching everybody that's getting off that Greyhound bus. John Lewis gets off, and I'm right behind him. And so we go into the terminal, Lucretia Collins, uh, John Lewis and myself, we walk in together, the front door. We all went to the lunch counter. And John Lewis said, I'm going to use the white restroom. He was arrested in the white restroom. Lucretia and I were arrested at the lunch counter. And so on the way out uh, of the door, Captain Ray was the arresting uh, patrolman. They put us in the paddy wagon, but we were all integrated in the paddy wagon. And once again, whenever they fill up the paddy wagon, We Shall Overcome was a song that we would sing. Now, after they got everybody in jail, there were 27 of us in jail, and a good friend of mine by the name of Bernard Lafayette was the first tenor. He would always lead some songs. And this particular song that he decided to lead, what, what it was saying was, we're not the only ones that are coming. We knew that every four days there would be a group uh, coming out of Nashville. We didn't know about the other states and cities, uh, about other freedom riders, but we knew that there would be another group every four days coming out of Nashville. Instead of coming from Nashville down to Birmingham to Montgomery and then across, they went from Nashville to Memphis and then straight down to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. So we're all in this cage waiting to have our be fingerprinted and mug shots. Bernard starts a song that tells the, the authorities to get ready. Buses are coming, oh yes. Buses are coming, oh yes. Buses are coming, buses are coming. Buses are coming, oh yes. Cut out all that noise. 
This is not a concert hall. That's what the authorities were saying. This is not a concert hall. You can't be singing in here. So Bernard turns to our group, the 26 of us, and says, what are they going to do? Put us in jail? <laughs> Better get you ready. Oh, yes. Better get you ready. Oh, yes. Better get you ready. Better get you ready. Better get you ready. Oh, yes. They're coming from Nashville. Oh, yes. They're coming from Nashville. Oh, yes. They're coming from Nashville. Coming from Nashville. Coming from Nashville. Oh, yes. Now, the other Freedom Riders that had joined us, Hank Crawford, uh, Hank Crawford, that's a musician. <laughs> Hank Thomas had come, flown from uh, Washington, D.C., back to Montgomery to rejoin the Freedom Ride. He was the one that was beaten in Anderson, Alabama. And so we said, they're coming from D.C., oh, yes. Wherever, whatever other city was represented amongst those 27, that's what we said. And so four days later, we had a group coming out of Nashville. Eight days later, another group came out of Nashville. Uh, all total, there were 100, and, well, we filled up the city jail, we filled up the county jail, then they took the 27 of us to the county farm. And this is when the governor and the attorney general decided, hey, these people are still coming, but we got them all over the state. So we, we got to put them all in one place. And that's when they sent us to Parchman Penitentiary. And so we were all housed in Parchman Penitentiary. There were over 325 of us on the original Freedom Ride, that, which the documentary covers. There were more Freedom Rides than just the one that I was on. There were Freedom Rides all over the United States. But the, the 325 of us who were in parchment, uh, that 325 represented 50% were uh, uh, black, 50% were white, 25% were females, 40% were between the age of 18 and 21. I had just turned 21 in, in uh, March. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, 39 states were represented and 13 different countries. Now, my mother didn't know that uh, I was on the Freedom Ride. <laughs> I had to go back to when I got off the bus and the TV camera caught me, a lady called my mother and says, where is your son? <laughs> and my mother said, well, he had classes this morning. He's over, at the, he's over at the office helping with the Freedom Rides, and then he's got band rehearsal tonight. No, honey, I just saw your son. He is in Jackson, Mississippi. He is on the Freedom Rides. And so, uh, naturally, uh, she called Jackson. I don't know how she got the number. But the thing to, for her to have done was to call the church, because we already had an attorney set up in Jackson and uh, he reported to the church in Nashville that we were all in jail, there was no beatings, no violence at all. And so all the parents had to do was to call the church to get the, the progress of the students that were in jail, at least from those of us from Nashville. We shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh. Uh -huh.